Now, in part one of the test revision video, we talked a bit about the refraction of light, particularly in relation to the eye. And we also talked about variations in this in the frequency of light as it travels through different medium. So let's go a bit deeper with refraction. So refraction is when light bends or changes directions as it moves from one medium to another where there's a variation in the density. And when we go from less dense to more dense, because light is traveling as a transverse wave, there's more resistance and it slows down in terms of its frequency. So if we look at this image here, we've got a incident ray that is traveling through air. So therefore the arrangement of the particles in the air are more spread out, there's less density. And then we go into water, a liquid. And so therefore those particles are more dense. So therefore this slows down the uh, frequency of that ray, the uh, refracted ray. And so it bends towards the normal. And so this GIF highlights this nicely. Again, we've got light going through medium one, which has a lower density in terms of the arrangement of the particles. And then we go into media two, which has a denser arrangement of particles. This slows down the light, and that's what we mean by refraction. And so therefore it bends towards that imaginary line that we call the normal line. Now, the opposite will occur if we have our uh, incident ray that is being transmitted through our more dense medium. So glass, for example, in this green bit, and then we break through the metaphoric divide between these two uh, media and we go to a less dense arrangement of the particles. And so in this case, the light will actually speed up in terms of its frequency and it will bend away from the normal line. Dispersion means spreading. So if a ray of white light radiates through a prism, that will cause the dispersion of light at different speeds to basically be transmitted out the other side, splitting into basically what we see as our different colors based on their variation in terms of the frequency. And this is what happens when we get sunlight going through droplets of rain and we get that rainbow effect at the bottom of the rainbow at the lower energy, lower frequency. We have the violets, we have the greens in the middle and we have those reds at the highest frequency. Again, what's happening is this light disperses, refracts at different angles based on their relative level of energy this table carefully in terms of our color perception. So for items, e.g. clothing, that appears black, no color is being reflected off that media. And so therefore that black shirt maybe that you're wearing is simply observing all of the other colors on the visual part of the spectrum. The opposite is true for white. So again, think about something white you're wearing your school shirt, etc. So we're reflecting all colors and not absorbing any ones. And so for all of the other colors, we're simply reflecting the color that is perceived and we're absorbing all of the other colors that are traveling through the air. Now, this is a bit biological, so we're not gonna to go too heavy on this at a year eight level, but at the back of your eye, we've already established that we have your retina. This is the part of the eye which has a bunch of photoreceptors and the job of the photoreceptors is to basically register and process light. And there's two different types. There's rods and cones. We won't worry about rods uh, at this point, we'll save that for a bit higher up in our secondary schooling. Let's focus a bit on the color on the cones, which process different colors. And we have basically three sets of cones. We have cones, uh, again, this is in the retina, that are basically sensitive to light that's traveling at this frequency at the lower end of the visual part of the spectrum, your blues and your violets. We have these mid-level ones that handle um, light that travels at around that 500 to 600 nanometer range for your greens. 
and then we have cones that are specialised to deal with the, these, um, the, the upper end of the visual portion of the spectrum that can deal with these light waves that have relatively more energy at the red end of the visual part of the spectrum. Now, given the three types of cones, if we activate two sets of cones um, based on the frequency of light, then we can get a perception of something that's a mix. So therefore, if we activate the red cones and the green cones, um, and there's equal input from both, then we get the perception of the yellow, which is in between that. On the test, we're not going to go too hard on that. That's kind of complicated. I'm wondering if you'd cover a bit of that in art. All right, now finally we get to sound waves. So again, be mindful about the dichotomy between a sound wave and a light wave. I've just dedicated a whole bunch of time in part one and part two in terms of the properties of light waves. So sound is a form of kinetic energy. Kinetic means movement. And so in order for a sound wave to travel, it needs some particles, some matter to vibrate in order to basically get that transfer of the energy from the source. So let's illustrate this further. So we've got Drew the dog here having a bark. And so what will happen is the energy from Drew's bark will basically be transferred to air particles just surrounding his gob. And so what will happen is those air particles will vibrate and then they'll transfer their energy to adjacent particles and they will vibrate. And then um, they will transfer their energy kinetically to the next, I guess, row of or circle of uh, air particles and so on. And so what's happening here is we're getting the vibration of these air particles uh, and therefore they're transferring their energy in a wave-like fashion. So sound waves are not transverse, they travel in a longitudinal manner caused by the vibration of the particles transferring their energy to adjacent particles and they're traveling in a straight line but not at a linear speed. Now, as is the case with a light wave that hits a surface, one of three things will happen with a sound wave when it hits a surface. If it's a hard, even surface, then the uh, sound wave will bounce off that surface and reflect off and the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection will apply as, did, as it did with a, a light wave. If it's a soft surface, then a lot of that energy will be transferred to that medium. Some of the sound will bounce off, but it will basically be reduced in terms of the energy, in terms of the volume. If it's an uneven surface, then when that sound wave hits the surface, it will bounce off, but in all different directions. And this is a good thing acoustically, um, if we want to get a bit of a enhance the quality of that sound, particularly with certain types of in instruments in your orchestra. Now, in the case of e echoes, there's a little bit of maths to this. So an echo is a reflection of a sound wave of a hard, even surface. But the human brain can only basically detect the difference between two sounds, the original sound and um, the reflected sound, if they're more than 0.1 of a second apart. Now, if they're less than that, e.g. 0.01, then the brain will metaphorically merge those sounds into one, and we won't be able to distinguish between the source of the sound and the echoed sound. Now, the maths here comes into the fact that sound travels through air, at around 340 meters per second. So therefore, given that 0.1 um, differential, 0.1 of 340 is about 34 meters. So therefore, if the source of the sound travels more than 17 meters to a hard surface, and then it travels uh, more than 17 meters back to the ear, then that will take more than 0.1 of a second. And so therefore, our brain will detect two different sounds. The original sound, the source of the sound, and the sound that's being echoed back at you. 
So therefore, when we're in a house, in a classroom, etc., you won't notice echoes because there's not many classes around um, where the wall is more than 17 metres away and plus there's other noises going on, etc. So just to ram home the point about the dichotomy between a sound wave and a light wave, sound travels in a longitudinal manner, all of the energy is travelling forward, whereas a light wave travels in a transverse fashion, we get the vibration of the energy from that mag magnetic fields, it's travelling forwards but also sideways at the same time. Now, as is the case with light waves, for sound waves, we can count the number of wavelengths that occur over a fixed point in one second. Uh, if we have a high frequency of sound waves, then that will be a high-pitched sound. And if we have a lower frequency, that will be a lower pitch sound. Now, if we look at the amplitude from the origin of the wave, the midpoint to the crest or the trough, that is basically a measure of the decibels, the volume of the sound. So high amp equals high decibels. So sound waves are traveling in a longitudinal fashion up and down the wavelength and when the sound gets to the crest of the wave, what will happen is the air particles will all compress. They'll be tightly packed in terms of the vibration of those air particles. And then the light, uh, the sound will continue to travel. And then we dip down to the trough of the wave down the bottom here. And the particles spread out in terms of the density. And then we repeat the process we get back to the crest of the wave and all of these particles will squish up, um, transferring their energy to the adjacent particles and so on. So compression of the wave is when all of the air particles squash together. This occurs at the crest and refraction occurs when the particles are spread out at the trough of the wave. So again, some more dichotomy here. Light can travel through a vacuum thanks to photons. Sound don't have that luxury. They need a medium which could be a solid liquid or a gas in order to transfer that energy kinetically to the particles that will vibrate. So therefore, with nothing to vibrate, sound can't travel through a vacuum, sound can't travel through space. And so when we look at the speed of sound through different medium, different states of matter, it's the exact opposite to light. Because if the particles are tightly packed, then it's much more efficient and more rapid to transfer the energy to the first, I guess, row of particles. They don't need to uh, move far to vibrate much to transfer their energy to the next um, wave, etc. So, so therefore, the denser the arrangement of the particles through a medium, the more rapidly the sound will travel. So sound will actually travel most rapidly through a solid, particularly a solid like a diamond that's really high in density. Uh, your liquids will be in the middle and gases, because there's a lot more distance between rows of particles in a gas, that slows down the frequency of that sound wave. And just to finish off, if we want to measure the speed of sound, we can simply work out how far it travels in one second and put that over a fraction to work out meters per second.